Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. If you were to ask anyone the term disciple, disciple of Messiah, what disciple comes into your mind? Almost everyone would say Simon Peter. And we're going to focus in on Peter in this last message of our study of John's Gospel. Why are we going to do that? Because Yeshua does. And we're going to learn some important truth about how we need to respond to that resurrection message that the kingdom is available today. Now it's coming in its fullness when Messiah returns. But the kingdom is within us in one sense today and we are called to live in obedience to kingdom truth demonstrating that kingdom perspective in all of our thoughts, all of our words, and all of our deeds. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the Gospel of John, that final chapter, John's Gospel and chapter 21. Now, Messiah, he has appeared the third time, and we'll see this, he has appeared the third time to the disciples, where? In Galilee. Why Galilee? A place of revelation. And he wants to reveal to the disciples, and that means also you and me, how we're supposed to respond to him, having been raised from the dead. What implications does that have for our life today? So once again, look with me, John's Gospel, chapter 21, and now we're ready for verse 15. Therefore, when they had eaten, Yeshua says to Simon Peter, Simon Peter. Jonah. Now, perhaps your Bibles will say Simon, son of Jonah. That's fine, but in the original text, the term son is not there. We would say in Hebrew, Shimon Yonah. Now, literally, that means listen to Jonah. Listen to what the story of Jonah taught. Jonah made a terrible decision that he was fleeing from the presence of God. And when we live in a mindset that does not reflect the kingdom, we're moving away from God. We're not doing what he has called us to do in the same way that Jonah did not. So he says, listen, Jonah, or Shimon Yonah, do you love me more than these? Now, why would he say that? Because not too long ago, on the night before he was crucified, Messiah, he told the disciples to pray that they would not fall into temptation because he said, you know what? There's a prophecy. The shepherd will be struck and the sheep is going to scatter. And you guys are going to deny me. And remember what Peter says? Peter says, you know what? All these other disciples, they might deny you. They might go away, but I'm different. I'm not like them. I will never leave you. I won't deny you. I'm ready to go to death for you. So Peter, he set himself above all the other disciples. And Peter, we know, he failed miserably. He denied Yeshua how many times? Well, he denied him three times before that rooster crowed. And Yeshua says to him, Simon Jonah, do you love me more than these? And pay attention, you can only see this in the Greek language because the word here for love is the word agape. It's in the verb form. So he says, do you love me? And this term for love means a sacrificial one. Are you willing to really lay down your life as you said? And notice what Peter says. He says to him, yes, Lord. That's wonderful that he says, Lord. He says, you know that I and there's a change in words. It's the word philo. Philo means to like something. You could say love, but it's not that same word. It's to love something a lot, but it's not that sacrificial, self-denying love. 
So Peter is maturing. See, it, it's, it's not wise for us to make promises that we can't, can't keep. Peter has matured. He says, you know, I like you. I love you. But has he really grown to be in that same love that Yeshua had, this self-denying love? I mean, are you really willing to lay down your life for the cause of this book? To be pleasing to your Savior, to be obedient to God? Well, we'd like to think so. But just to give a flippant, yes, I am, and not count the cost, well, you ought not do that. And Peter's not being that same individual that always runs up ahead and always thinks that he can deliver when in the flesh he may not be able to. So he says, yes, Lord, you know that I like you. And, and Yeshua says to him, feed my lamb. Now, that's important because it's speaking about an immature sheep. Feed my lambs. Then it says, look now at verse 16. And he says again a second time, Shimon Yona, do you love me? Now, nothing's changed. Same terminology. Do you love me? The sacrificial agape, the sacrificial way. And he says to him, yes, Lord, you know that I, and it's the word philo, like you. Now, it can be love, but it's not that same powerful word to be self-denying. Peter understands. You know what? Maybe in the flesh he can't measure up. Maybe he won't be that person that he thought he could be, this one who denies himself. Peter is responding in a humble way. Yeshua says, you know, do you love me in this sacrificial way? And he says, you know, I love you, but I, I, I'm not sure if I can reach that point. So notice what happens. It says in the scripture, do you love me? Peter says, yes, you know that I love you, but it's philo. And Yeshua says to him, shepherd my sheep. Now, this is good because it speaks about sheep. There's a change in the text from lambs being immature to sheep. But he doesn't say feed, he simply says shepherd. Now, here's the key. A shepherd who has great experience, he can lead the sheep where they're going to feed. Why? They're going to be there longer. But an inexperienced one can lead them from changing from one pasture to another. But when the feed, sheep are there to graze and be there in a long time, you want a more experienced one. So in this context, Peter is maturing. He wasn't just, you know, pushing to say, oh, okay, yes, I can. You've asked me this once. I said, I'm not sure. Now I'm sure. No, he didn't say that. He says again to him, Lord, you know that I love you, but it's a lesser love. He says, shepherd my sheep. Look now to verse 17. And a third time he says to him, Simon Jonah, and he changes. He doesn't say agape. He uses the word phileis. He says, Simon Jonah, do you love me? And Peter, he is grieved. He's sad because he thinks that, well, I've moved down. No, Yeshua is saying something. It's right to understand that, that we, in and of ourselves, we're not going to live a life that shows that agape love. We're called to it. But, but it's a struggle. And it's when we think we'll stand that we'll fall. And it's when we're unsure that we can stand that we'll rely upon Him. So he says to him this time, you know, Peter, do you like me? And Peter's grieved. And he said to him the third time, that, that Yeshua said to him the third time, it grieved him. And he says, Lord, you know all things. You know exactly where I am spiritually. You know all things. You know that I am philo, that I like you or love you, but not agape. And Yeshua says to him, and it's a promotion. He says, feed my sheep. Now, here's the key. Peter was not uh, pushed in because of the repetition of the question. He was not put up into the situation where he says, you know what, I'm just going to say it. No, Peter looked carefully at himself. 
I'm sure Peter remembered those three times that he denied him and he didn't want to to say something untrue. So Peter did well. Now notice it's three times. I shared with you a few weeks ago that we were to talk about a biblical understanding of the number three. If you go back, for example, to the book of Jonah, that's a reference here, Simon, the son of Jonah. Remember what, what Jonah wanted? Jonah wanted to flee from the presence of the Lord. So God tested that. He put him three days in the belly of a great fish to see, do you really want to flee from me? You don't want anything to do with me? And on the third day, what happens? The scripture says that Jonah longed for the sanctuary of the Lord. Who dwells in the sanctuary? God does. So Jonah was proven wrong. He didn't want to flee. Well, here we see three times why to prove, to reveal that Peter has matured. Why am I so sure that that's the proper explanation? Well, look at what happens after this. Look now to verse 18. Yeshua begins by saying, truly, truly, that's powerful. He is making a prophecy concerning Simon Peter. Now, Peter, he failed Yeshua miserably, did he not? When he denied him those three times. But Peter's going to mature. He understands his weakness. He understands that he in and of himself can't do it. And he is not so sure that he can be that faithful self-denying, that one that would pick up his cross and follow him. And when we understand our frailty, that we can't do it in and of ourselves, if we're willing to rely upon Him. And three times He says to Yeshua, Lord. Well, when we make that type of proclamation, we're going to mature. And that's why Yeshua says, look at verse 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked where you wanted. You did what you wanted. You made the decisions. But He says, but whenever you are old, and that word means very old. Now, it can be thought of as maturity. But when you have great maturity, you will stretch forth your hands and another will clothe you and lead you to where you don't want to be. Look at verse 19. We read here, and this was said signifying what type of death he would glorify God. Now, this concept of stretching out your hands has to do, most scholars believe, with the fact that Peter was going to die by crucifixion as well. So understand what's taking place here. It's when Peter says, and if you're not trained in the scripture, you almost think like Peter is, is missing it, but he's not. He is saying, you know, Lord, I really, really like you. And I'm not going to flippantly say that I can love you with this self-denying love. Messiah says, well done. And you know what? You are going to mature. And when you're really mature, you are going to bear witness. You're going to glorify me by laying down your knife, by stretching out your hands, being crucified. So once again, verse 19, and this he said signifying what death that he would glorify God. Verse 20, and after saying this, he says to him, follow me. Now, here's the message that we need to see. What do, am I expected to do? What does he tell me that his expectations are for my life? Just to follow him. Just make it your desire. Make it your utmost passion to follow him. And he'll lead you, he'll mature you, and you will find that your life, like Peter's, will be used in some way to glorify him. Isn't that what it's all about? But if you're not willing to follow him, you're not going to be someone that is an instrument of glorifying God. That should be our utmost desire, to glorify him. So he says, follow me. Well, it gets even better, verse 20. And Peter turning and sees the disciple whom Yeshua loves following. Now, this is the same disciple, and this is what the scripture is going to tell us, second half of verse 20. This is the same one who leaned at 
dinner, this is the Passover, uh, night before Passover, that leaned on his breast, that is the breast of, breast of Yeshua. And Peter's speaking, he says, Lord, what about the one who betrayed you? Now, this is the one where Peter was at that meal and Peter saw the disciple whom Yeshua loved leaning on his breast and Peter says gave him a motion saying you know ask him about the one who is betraying you who it is so it's just to emphasize what disciple we're talking about that disciple who was very close to Yeshua and he said this Peter did to Yeshua what about this one what about this disciples what's going to happen to him you see Peter knew that he was being prophesied that he was going to die by crucifixion to honor God. And he sees this other disciple, this one whom Yeshua loved. And he says, and it just to verse 20 is to tell us who we're speaking about. He says, what's going to happen to this one? Verse 22. And Yeshua says, if I will him to remain until I come, what is this to you? Follow, you follow after me. Now, here's the lesson. We will not mature. We will not be the people that Messiah wants us to be. We will not carry out the call that God has for our life unless, unless we simply follow him without thinking about how he moves in other people's life. What are their calls? Am, am I getting what I really deserve? Is it fair for me to die and him not? No. Don't worry about those things. Don't worry about how the master judges and deals with his other servants. You just follow him. And let me share with you, when you make that as your goal, God, you reveal something to me, you show me where you're going, how you want to be leading my life, and I'm going to follow. When you do that without worrying about others, how God's moving in their life, what he's telling them and all that, you do what he calls you to do. And don't worry about what he calls others to do. When you do that, you are going to mature. And you're going to be used in a mighty way to glorify God. Well, Peter, he's focusing in on that other disciple, this, this disciple that has that preferred relationship. So he says, what about him? Look again at verse 22. And Yeshua says, if him I wish to remain until I come. What is this to you? You follow me. Verse 23. Therefore, this word goes out among the brethren that that disciple would not die. So they began to say, you know, it's this favorite disciple, so to speak, this one that Yeshua loved. Now, let me tell you, we need to be very careful because this term, whom he loved, does not mean anything about favorite, that it was the preferred, that he was special in some uh, uh, way. What it means is this. The same term is used back in the book of Genesis. And it has to do with the child that was Yaakov's child of his uh, elderly age, of his uh, family, and we're speaking about Joseph. Now, do you think that that this father loved Joseph more than, all of, more than all the others? No, he did not. But because he was older when Joseph was young, when Joseph was at home, Jacob was at home. And therefore, he got to invest more. What this scripture is saying is because this disciple, what do we read? He's leaning on the breast of Yeshua. That is, he's close to him. He was always someone who wanted to be close to Yeshua. And when we are close to him, we're going to get that special attention. It's not who he was, but it was where he positioned himself. And the word went out, look again to verse 23, and this word went out among the disciples that this disciple would not see death. But this is not what Yeshua said. He didn't say that he would not see death, but if him I want to remain, it's just a statement. If I should want him to remain until I come, what is this to you? It's not a, a demonstrative statement that he is going to remain until he comes. He says, what if? That's all. 
Now we come to the final two verses of John's Gospel. What a meaningful book. How important this is. And notice how it ends, verse 24. This is the disciple that testifies concerning these things. And I have written them. So he says, this is my testimony. And the word testimony has to do with what he witnessed, what he saw. He was an eyewitness to them. And then it says, and I have written these things down in this book. Now, he did that, not alone, meaning he wrote these things down and other disciples were aware of them. They are going to give their stamp of validation to it. He says here, look at verse 24 again, and these things I have written down, the second half of verse 24, shows a change. It goes from the first person, what he has done, to now the group. And says, and we know, that's these other disciples, they are saying, we know that true is his testimony. We've seen it too, and it's factual. So John's gospel is written in a way that shows historical events. He writes it as a legal document that is one which comes with testimony, that it's proven history, so that we might what? That we might believe. Now look at verse 25. And we read in verse 25, and many other things Yeshua did, which are not written, and if they were written in one book, it says here, I suppose the world could not contain the things written, that is, the things written in these books. So many other things Yeshua did. We only have a small testimony of the deeds, the works, the teachings of Yeshua in this gospel. And if everything was written down, the world could not contain it. Now, what are we supposed to glean from that? Well, I believe what it's saying is this. Not only did Yeshua do so much more, and think of it this way. You know, if I were to ask you, well, what is God doing in your life? You know what? He's doing a lot more than you think. He is our defender. He is warring the angels, are warring with the enemy continuously for us. He's doing so much ongoing in our life. We don't see it. We may not thank Him for it. We may not recognize it, but He's at work. And what the Scripture is reminding us is that God does so much more than the world recognize or the world can contain. It also speaks about a transformation coming. When He says the world can't contain all these things, and the world doesn't even recognize all these things, you know where they're going to be recognized? You know what's going to contain them? that is the kingdom of God. What John ends with in the terminology that he uses is a transition. The world can't contain the mighty deeds of Messiah. And that's why this world's coming to an end. And what's going to be established? The kingdom of God. And the last word of John chapter 21, the last word of John's entire gospel is the word, Amen. And that comes from a word, it's Hebrew, it's written in Greek, but it comes from a Hebrew word which means believe. It's a commandment, believe this thing. So it's so significant that the last thing that John leaves us with is a call to act faithfully, to believe the testimony that he gave. And what did he say? Well, what he ended his book in when he spoke to the disciples is that you might be believing that Yeshua is the Messiah and the Son of God. Now, why is that so important? That term, Son of God, by the way, when Messiah testified before the Sanhedrin, we see as well that he responded. He didn't say much to Caiaphas, that high priest. But when he was asked, are you the Son of the Most High, he agreed. Yeshua spoke of Him being the Son of God. Why is that so important? Not just that it relates to His divinity, but it relates to Him being the heir of all things. Son is related to heir. This book leads us 
to a conclusion that we have a great inheritance. And here's the question, do you believe that? Do you believe that God has a great inheritance for you? It's not in this world. The world cannot contain the blessings that God wants to give to you, the blessings of the kingdom. They are not of this world. They are different in nature. And therefore, you must believe in order to be transformed, to become an heir of the kingdom blessings. See, when we read John's Gospel, we should be people that are excited. We should be people that get enthused about the future. We should not approach this life with a sense of, well, I've come to my end. That's what so many people do. I was talking to some friends of mine. They're considerably older, about 30 years, and they went to a memorial service. And they saw people that they had not seen for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And what a change. Most of them were in their late 80s and early 90s. And they came back from this meeting not happy that they saw friends, perhaps the last time they're going to see them, but they came back dejected. Why? Because for them, that scene just reinforced the coming of the end of their lives. And they were saddened by that. <laughs> I wouldn't be. Because the end of my life is going to be the beginning of a kingdom experience. What did Messiah say in this book? He says, I'm going away, but I'm coming back. And I'm going to take you to a place that I have prepared for you that where I am, you shall be always. Don't you want to be in that place? Don't you want to have what He has prepared for you? That's a kingdom experience. So our life ends, but a new kingdom experience begins. And up until that time, if you're wise, you're going to want to do everything you can in this body, equipped with the Holy Spirit, to testify to others of the nearness of that kingdom, that they might know the truth of the gospel, and that this end, well, it's not an end, it's a transformation. Because as you look at these 90-year-old people, hunched over, sick, having a difficulty going upstairs, you know what we find? In the kingdom, we're going to have a new body, a glorious body that represents the power and the eternity of Almighty God. Be excited about the future. Well, we're out of time until next week when we begin our study of the book of Hebrews. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.